Let's move to France, where, again, people are certainly changing their minds. There uh, is a fantastic thread here. Um, I want to make sure I say this gentleman's name correctly. I think it's Arnaud, Arnaud Bertrand. Should we go with that? Um, yep. He has had some fantastic insights into French politics that we wanted to put here on the show just because it is possibly a harbinger of some major change that's happening here in the U.S. But probably most importantly, it's just that the European like neoliberal consensus, as we previously talked about at the G7, has never been more unpopular actually with European voters. So let's go ahead and put this up there on the screen. This is some analysis basically about the French election that is upcoming, which was called by Emmanuel Macron after the shock win of Marine Le Pen's party in the European parliamentary elections. What Arnaud Bertrand says here is that the left, quote, got their shit together, quote, very fairly fast, almost immediately announcing the creation of a popular front that gathers all of the left wing parties. Let's go to the next part. He says, it's on the right that things have really started to go wild. After the president of one of the major center-right parties, the party of Jacques Chirac and of Nicolas Sarkozy, announced that he would then do an alliance with Marine Le Pen's party. Let's go to the next one. He says, almost immediately, though, top officials in that party started saying that person was speaking in their name only, and he needed to resign from the party's presidency. And now there is some major infighting as to who is is managing this party? Are they going to ally with Le Pen or not? Let's go continue. He says, meanwhile, Macron is, quote, shooting at this newly formed popular front, saying that those who are joining it are, quote, anti-Semites. So we're bringing some of the Israel stuff into this. And because the left-wing party coalition, quote, campaigned for a lot of Palestinians. So obviously that makes them and everyone with them anti-Semitic. So continue, if we want, um, here in some of this analysis. If we look at the actual projections, it looks like right now, and this is from the Financial Times, that the far right block, his words, of Marine Le Pen and some of the leftovers of the right wing are in the lead for 362 seats. The left wing block, the so-called popular front, is in the lead with 211 seats. Meanwhile, Macron's party is in the lead in just three seats. And none of these three seats are even in France. All of them are seats for French people abroad. And then that old center-right party is in the lead for just one. So remember, as he said, the election is two rounds. The projections for the second round are that the left and the far right would battle it out for the 536 seats, but that the Macron alliance would only make the runoff in some 41 seats. So basically, it, quote, looks like they will essentially destroy Macronism as a political force in France. Either that is somehow 90 chess that no one understands or his dissolution of the French parliament is one of the stupidest moves ever <laughs> by a French president. Is it uh, is it 90 chess or is it hungry, hungry hippos? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking hungry, hungry hippo. Probably dumber than hungry, hungry hippo. Um, I mean, look, I mean, I think it's fascinating because I don't, again, I don't really know why he's doing this at all. What we do know here is that the neo-lib consensus in France, which is a leading indicator, I would say, for the rest of the continent, it's dead. It's either left or right, and actually like left or right in terms of who is going to win here. And Le Pen and her party, it's looking like a historic first for them to actually genuinely take power. And this is ahead of the 2027 election where if they do so, I mean, this destroys Emmanuel Macron, his entire legacy as the president of France. And his real legacy would almost be like Obama ushering in this new era as opposed to actually doing anything himself. It is remarkable. I think he was betting on, which is usually a safe bet, left-wing dysfunction. Yes. He was thinking that the lefties wouldn't be able to get their shit together, wouldn't form this popular front, which they did very quickly and were able to, you know, announce candidates in all of these seats. A, um, incredible feat of organizational muscle from, you know, a group of individuals who are not really known for such. And so he thought they would remain splintered. And then he would be able to bet on, you know, what is, he hopes, still a majority revulsion towards the far right and Le Pen and be able to convince people like the lesser of two evils, kind of a vote once again, and be able to potentially pick up seats. Instead, they did get their act together. And so as you were laying out, you know, what will happen is you'll have an initial vote in all of these districts and then the top two vote-getting parties, then they'll head to the runoff. So if you're not in the top two, that's it. Game over. Mm -hmm. They're leading in three seats. They're only potentially making it to the runoff in right now projected some 40 seats. So you're done. 
now you have the the left and the right battling it out for the future. And listen, I don't want to read too much into it, but I think when you look here and you look at the negative approval ratings for, you know, G7 leaders, when you look at Joe Biden and, you know, the disgust for, for him and his, the sense that the economy is going backwards and the country's on the wrong track, which has really been a sentiment that's been picking up and picking up over the years. It's just pretty clear that for most people in these countries, they feel, not that they would articulate it this way, but they feel that the neoliberal consensus that has reigned for, you know, 40 plus years really started under Jimmy Carter and then um, sort of solidified under Ronald Reagan and then Bill Clinton, it has failed them. It has failed to deliver secure economic security for them. It has failed to deliver higher wages. It has increasingly funneled more and more and more wealth to the very top. It has not had any significant answers for, you know, various societal issues. And so they're they're done with it. Um, I also think it's really interesting in the context of Macron, I brought this up before, but again, has some, you know, potential implications for Joe Biden, although you don't want to read too much into these things because they have such a different political system than we do. But Macron did try to, he realized immigration was a big problem for him. He tried to do more hardline things. They were so significant that, you know, Le Pen was saying, hey, this is an ideological win for me. Macron's own party was rejecting it and wouldn't vote for it, et cetera. And surprise, surprise, like if you're an immigration hardliner, that wasn't going to ignore, like that wasn't going to make you fall in love with Emmanuel Macron. And same in the U.S., as Biden tries to signal this, you know, let me be more hardline on immigration shift, you're not going to win over Trump supporters. Like if your immigration is your top issue, you're still not voting for Joe Biden. So that ploy really hasn't worked for Macron. It hasn't worked for any of the European leaders. And I don't think it's going to work for Joe Biden either. It's complicated. I agree. Uh, In terms of the politics there. Also, I would say the polling here is so radically shifting. We should cover this tomorrow. I've been sending some stuff. I'll save some of my comments on that. Let's put this up there uh, on the screen because this highlights exactly what you're talking about. Look here at the approval ratings for the G7 leaders. So you've got Olaf Scholz, minus 51 in Germany. Trudeau, minus 38 in Canada. Minus 31 for Macron in France. Minus 10 for Maloney in Italy. She somehow is the most popular lady on the entire stage. Biden, minus 18.5 for his approval rating. Kishida in Japan is at minus 40. I don't know what's going on in Japan. I need to look into that more. And then Rishi Sunak takes the cake, minus 54. So like you said, Each of these are individual leaders. Each of these have individual circumstances. But we are more connected than at any time before. And, you know, one of the things about globalization is that all of our economies look more similar today than they ever did in the past. So what we can generally surmise across all of these is that you have a deceleration of wealth, you know, for the bottom tranche or really the bottom half of a lot of these societies. Safety sets, safety social nets or not, in general, economic opportunity is being divided. You see higher inflation against all all of these economies. And in each one, there is a asking of the new generation, which is flirting with left and right politics, which have not been seen in any of these countries in decades. You see this with the rise of a major right-wing coalition in Japan. You see the AFD doing incredibly well in Germany. Uh, I believe um, in Canada and in France, you're seeing some similar dynamics. And then Italy, of course, Maloney herself was heralded allegedly as some like right-wing person, although she's governed uh, very differently while she's in office. But at the very least, in every instance, you know, if we are seeing a flirting with different types of politics, which were unheard of really yeah. in the last 45 years or so, which means some sort of new quote unquote world order, no con- conspiracy, is <laughs> likely inevitable if we are to hew to democracy. Now, I mean. Let's be honest, though, we could go in the other direction. Just because they're unpopular doesn't mean that they couldn't become more dictatorial and controlling Mm -hmm. and censorship written to try and control the current world order that we are in. I think that's the more likely path because all of them have such a religious devotion, for example, to Ukraine. I mean, this entire summit is basically just being a slave to Ukraine and being like, oh, here's 50 billion more dollars and we're with you until the very end and let's endorse your BS peace conference and all of this other stuff, but but again, they're doing so in a very unpopular manner if you look at the feedback from all of the demo- actual democracies for what's happening. So that's really, I think, the only way that we can connect and why I think the France example is so important is because it really is part of a global phenomenon. Just previously, like we saw with Brexit last time yeah. in 2015. 
Yeah, and I think it's important to say too, because you could look at those numbers and go, oh, well, I mean, first of all, Joe Biden's doing better than a lot of these people. Mm -hmm. Second of all, you could say, oh, well, they're just like a victim of circumstance because they had COVID and now you've got inflation as a result of COVID. And so people are very upset about that and they're blaming their leaders, even though, you know, this is a consistent theme across the countries. So it's not all the leader's fault. But if we look then at the numbers for AMLO in Mexico, where they also have struggled with, you know, inflation and GDP growth isn't astronomical, though there is a lot of, you know, there's um, increasing as there's been more move towards nearshoring and away from China. There is a lot of economic possibility for, for Mexico right now that I think people are there are very excited about. But you had a different economic program that actually delivered wage increases, significant wage increases beyond, notably beyond inflation for average Mexican workers. And so because of that, in spite of the difficult global circumstances, you know, AMLO, one of the most popular leaders in the entire world. So it's not that, you know, they're just a victim of, of fate and circumstance and there was absolutely nothing that they can do. People have rightly judged that there were other pathways open to them and they didn't take it and that they aren't focused on delivering for their lives. Instead, they're focused on, you know, backing Israel and their endless assault against Gaza and backing Ukraine in what has become, you know, a hopeless situation rather than improving the lives of their own taxpaying citizens. So, yeah. you know, I, I think some of those themes are probably very consistent across those countries. Well, there's a couple lessons. So like I just said, I have the most popular leaders in front of me. Uh, some of the, I, One of these surveys is actually after the Indian election. Even though India, uh, Modi suffered a setback, he and AMLO are the two most popular leaders in the world. What can you at least say about those two leaders? Neither would ever be accused of being quote unquote neoliberal. And in fact, mm -hmm. have explicitly rejected the, over, the uh, implicit neoliberal consensus. So in India's case, you have the con Congress party. This was the neoliberal party been power for decades, very similar actually to Mexico and they're part of ruling coalition. Modi comes in and basically sweeps it off the table, turns it almost into an irrelevant political force that whose only victory is winning a few more seats but still not being in power. AMLO, very similar, basically just delivered this huge mandate for his party in Mexico, despite, I mean, a lot of troubling coalition, uh, troubling problems, but at the very least in Mexico, the ruling, previously ruling center-right party, they're not in the discussion as part of the actual solution. The voters don't even count them in their mind. So I think in both of those cases, we could see that if you are willing to move in that direction, you can reap massive political rewards um, in, in either of those. However, you know, the G7, these economies, like I said, these are some of the most highly developed economies in the world. In a certain sense, like the elites of all of those countries do control things at a much higher level. Whereas in a developing nation, I think for some reason, you know, you you can both have like lots of oligarchy, but you can have some sort of democratic revolt and institutions are not nearly as entrenched and are probably easier to take on um, in that certain scenario. So it's, I mean, it's a fascinating discussion, honestly, like we said, about the whole new world order and what that may look like, as opposed to, we really have two options, like going down the path of democracy or more control, more censorship. They'll probably try for the former. The only question is, is it actually gonna work? Yeah, and of course, to bring it back to the U.S., um, even as we have a number of third-party candidates on the ballot because of the nature of our system, we don't really have a non-neoliberal option. Yeah, you know? right. <laughs> We true. have yes. Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Donald Trump, Matt Stiller did a phenomenal piece. We're actually gonna try to have him on the show to talk about it, about the way Trump doesn't even talk about going after business anymore. He doesn't even pretend. Um, instead, he's in these fundraising rooms promising them everything that they could possibly want. And we know, of course, when he was in office, well, he did do some things, especially vis-a-vis -vis China, vis-a-vis uh, -vis renegotiating NAFTA that were different and a genuine break from the past neoliberal consensus. You know, the primary accomplishment was the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, which, you know, was sitting on the shelf from the, the neoliberal Reaganite type of system. That's one of his primary promises moving forward is we're going to make sure we continue those tax cuts. So you really don't have another option, although stylistically, Trump gives the vibes of being a real threat to the system, even as he's promising them like, no, 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 I'm going to do what you want. And billionaires are responding to that. I mean, he's, this is another way going back to how the, the coalitions are shifting. You know, under Obama and um, Hillary and Biden last time around, Wall Street really started going for Democrats. 
they're going back to Republicans now. They're going back to backing Trump. They feel very comfortable with him because they don't like under Biden the antitrust move and the, the more pro-labor um, posture. So in any case, that's part of what makes our system unique and in my opinion, uniquely bad is that we don't really have any options beyond the status quo. Yeah, certainly, especially in the modern era. Didn't always used to be like this, though, uh, at least back in the 1800s and early 1900s. Hey, if you like that video, hit the like button or leave a comment below. It really helps get the show to more people. And if you'd like to get the full show ad-free and in your inbox every morning, you can sign up at breakingpoints.com. That's right. Get the full show. Help support the future of independent media at breakingpoints.com.